everyone and welcome back to Inside the Markets. I'm your host Sunlight and today I'm joined by Wojtek Pavlovsky of Maven 11. So, watch on to find out about what Maven 11 is all about, Wojtek's favourite trading strategies and also his thoughts on the macroeconomic environment. So Wojtek, welcome to the show, how are you? Yeah, I'm very good and how are you? I'm good, thank you. So, would you like to give us an introduction about yourself and how you got into trading? Sure. Um, so I'm Wojtek. I know if I should uh, put my age here, but I'm almost <laughs> 27. So let's let's have the basic facts also here. Um, yeah, I um, I basically moved from Warsaw because I'm originally from from Warsaw, from Poland. I moved to Amsterdam after um, after high school. I wanted to study in English, broaden my horizons and um, yeah, go to a good school. Um, so I found it here. Um, I was studying finance on my bachelor and then quantitative finance on my master's. In, um, in around 2016, I think it was, it was my first experience with uh, trading. I don't consider it trading you know like when you're using platforms like plus 500 and all of these you know i call them sunday brokers for people that uh, you know don't care about the fees they are just uh, placing some orders and and treating it more like gambling so i was more the same but i wanted to have the financial angle in it as a finance student so uh, so this is how i started and um uh, we created a so-called investment group with our uh, with our group of friends, group of students at at university, and uh, we actually had a pretty smart idea. Uh, I don't know if we want to, um, you know, explore it a bit more or just like a fresh introduction here. So maybe I leave that for later. So around 2015, 2016 was uh, was the first time I encountered encountered so-called trading. And uh, early 2017, I fully moved to to crypto. Um, but actually, I think it would be pretty interesting to also talk about the initial strategy because it was uh, pretty cool and smart. So yeah, no, we... I'd love I'd love to know more about the the initial trading strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not like it's not like I'm trying to to brag here or anything, but it was just uh, it was just cool, and uh, I'm pretty proud of it because it was the first time um, I actually got so much into trading or actually using uh, your brain power to to extract some value from the market. So the idea is, I already mentioned that brokers like Plus500 or I think it was FX something like a UK broker, whatever, it doesn't really matter. All of them, they had one thing in common, which is something called negative balance protection. So negative balance protection means that you cannot lose more money than you deposit to your account. So during high volatile events, especially macro events, um, you could use very high leverage. At the time, it could be even one to 500 on something like DAX or on, on Forex. And what we did, we basically had one account going long and one account going short. So you would say, yeah, it's just hedging, whatever, with super high leverage and probably super high fees. But we were selecting events that um, could produce like highly volatile um, outcomes at the start of the trading day. So let's say there was Brexit, and that's actually the best event that we ever ever had. Um, because on Friday evening, I think just before the market closes, we opened both positions, one long with 500x leverage, one short with 500x leverage. And then obviously on Monday morning, when Brexit happened and the surprise was big, like the market opened, I don't remember actually if it was minus or plus 10% on, on the pairs that we, uh, that we bought, but it didn't really matter. For us to break even, excluding costs, you needed just a change of 0.2%. So when something with leverage one to 500, so when something exploded plus minus 10%, like the returns were absolutely insane. And then obviously one position, which was wrong, so let's say a short one was wrong, uh, is wiped out. But if you put there one k, you just lose this one k. Normally, like you know, you would be minus hundred k, for example, on it. 
so that's gone. And other account, which was right, basically went unlimited up. Uh, so that was like our first like huge victory. And then we were doing that with US elections and with many other events. So we, we started like actually printing money with that. And what the brokers did, of course, they didn't like that because they don't like clients that they, they were losing cash because of this negative balance protection, actually, because they were not able to close our position on time. So it was going super negative, this one account. So they started going after us and um, <laughs> they started blocking our accounts based on IP because we were like really gathering like four or five people in the same room <laughs> whole night. Because, the, you know, when you open a position with one to 500 leverage, it's like any large swing can actually wipe you off. Even if it's like a couple of seconds before the market closes, it can wipe you off in instantly almost. Um, so there was a lot of emotions and drama and some mistakes. Uh, but all in all, then we started doing like cross brokerage. So one brokerage account going long and the other one going short. So then they couldn't see, obviously, that like at one broker you have long, long then it didn't really matter. But then it became harder and harder and harder. And just like this game that we were trying to always extract this value. Um, and unfortunately, the new regulations in Europe came that like the max leverage was limited from that point. I think on the pairs that we were trading, it was like from one to 500, it was dropped to one to 20. So then the change that you need at market opening was so ridiculously high that it was no longer <clears throat> even worth it to pursue this strategy. So we were sad. We made some good money. So it was like this beginning of something new and we needed to find a new place where, you know, still with relatively small bankroll, you can count on good volatility. And this is how my friend from, from this group introduced me to crypto. So in early 2017, we were like, okay, we cannot do what we did best, meaning just <laughs> clicking long and short button and looking at the uh, volatile <laughs> event. It was not much, I, what I'm trying to say, there was not much trading in it. It was just like mm -hmm. understanding the rules, how the brokers operate and trying to use that to our advantage. So like playing against the casino because casino has a loophole. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what we did. But then we we decided we need to move to something um, exciting. So So crypto was the thing. I was the big XRP soldier at the start. It was my first uh, crypto <laughs> because I was always trying to be this guy that, um, you know, doesn't believe really in the hippie movement of crypto. I thought the bank is going to take it all. So XRP is a perfect uh, representation of this um, idea. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with time, I realized maybe uh, the truth, uh, not necessarily place there but um yeah so we we, we started invested personally with the money that we uh that we made with with the earlier strategy and we also started for because i didn't mention it before but other people also invested with us in during the first phase with those brokers um so we actually gathered like a group of 30 students friends and family that were already investing with us and, and making some nice cash sometimes outrageous it was actually so nice to see that some people went for dream holidays because they put 100 euros and they had like 2k for example from one uh, from one event so it was also nice that people were happy we were happy everything was working fine and then we needed to give the these people some new exposure so we are creating cryptocurrency portfolios for them obviously not really knowing anything about it just like yeah what you learned at at university and uh, mm -hmm. just what you think makes sense so it was all very amateuristic actually but yeah obviously we're lucky because if you put money in early 2017 in crypto there is no way that you would actually be on minus at the end of 2017 the problem was that Back in the days, I really believed that there is a new paradigm shift and that it's going to be upon me. So uh, <laughs> I obviously, I, you know, I now. yeah, I, I <laughs> learned that it doesn't necessarily work this way. And, you know, there is a finite, finite amount of people that need to buy something from you in order 
<clears throat> to maintain the, the the price increase. This, this was something that I didn't understand. I, I didn't understood. I didn't understand. Sorry. Um, before and obviously, like the majority of the paper gains uh, disappeared in uh, in January two thousand eighteen. Yeah. It was also all of this thing with ICOs, which I actually wrote my bachelor thesis about. So I was the only student, or the only student on my uh, on my year that was doing his bachelor thesis about crypto, and I was trying to uh, actually do something better than just descriptive analysis. What is Bitcoin? So actually, my uh, bachelor thesis was about like how to spot particular characteristics of ICOs before it actually the sale uh, starts to know that on the first day of the listing on a crypto exchange that you're going to make money or not. So I basically okay. statistically prove like that if there is a hard cap, for example, on sale, that there is a limited amount of tokens to be sold, then statistically you should be able to make money, which makes sense because if somebody else wanted to buy this token and they didn't get into the pre-sale, like with those hot ICOs like Kyber Network, for example, back in the days, which I fortunately was in, um, <laughs> then they need to buy it from you. And obviously, you know, the first day it's very, very volatile and we all, or at least some remember uh, how crazy it was with all of the, the the paper gains and not only paper gains with with ICO. So it was crazy, and um, and yeah, like then uh, after after like January two thousand eighteen when things started collapsing, and I also thought like yeah, we're gonna come back quickly, bounce, <laughs> you know, and uh, everything gonna be all right again. Uh, that obviously didn't happen. And I was so pissed at myself that like, really, it was life changing money for me at that time. Like I still cashed out a significant amount, but it was like pennies compared to what I could if I would sell the top, which obviously doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, but I was so pissed that I promised to myself that if I will be lucky enough to to have the next opportunity, I will be way more prepared. I actually... Uh, joined Maven 11 um, when Bitcoin was still trading below 10k. I think it was October October 2020. Um, so once again, I was lucky to join the professional environment and mm -hmm. still, you know, capture the whole next cycle with it and be surrounded by professionals not like last time by friends who also <laughs> saw like <laughs> crazy amount of money on their blockfolio mm -hmm. and yeah, uh, like a and mini they were hedge all... fund yeah Ex exactly, actually so exactly. yeah could you actually give us an introduction to maven 11 and what your role is there now in a more professional sure. capacity as you said yeah, sure, sure. So as I said, I joined as an intern. I was actually hired through LinkedIn. So that's a free advertisement for, for LinkedIn that they found me on LinkedIn. I didn't even know actually about existence of Maven 11, which is pretty weird because they are the largest player here in the Netherlands. And I and I wanted to work in crypto in an investment fund or in a trading firm. But uh, Maven 11 is a venture fund mainly. Um, and um uh, we we have couple like entities surrounding the the venture fund, so to say. Uh, so one of them is the credit business, which I'm highly involved in. Um, we also have asset management, uh, which is like first, I think first or or one of the very first uh, fully regulated uh, in in Europe. Um, we also have something called C11 Labs. It's more like quant support to our portfolio companies providing liquidity, doing like arbitrage or any strategies that are actually helping the, the projects that, that we support. Um, and I think that's it. But so the core business is uh, it's venture fund. Uh, actually, we have two now. I think total AOM, it's around 250 million, which for Europe, I think it's like one of the the leaders in terms of AOM at least. And we um, we specialize in seed or pre-seed rounds, infrastructure, DeFi. Um, we, just to give example of, of, of our portfolio, we are, <clears throat> I think the first ticket in something called Celestia, maybe some people know it, like the modular blockchain, very, very hot topic and upcoming these days. So um, that's our passion. 
uh, I was, when I joined, I was, I think, fifth employee in the company. So it was still very early. And as an intern, I was doing a bit of everything. I was on the venture side. Um, I was uh, helping with the liquid side. Credit was not there back in the days. Um, so then like the company started growing, we raised our fund too. Uh, so that was like a big boost uh, in terms of AUM and, and, and I guess like also cash to, to expand. So right now we have 26 employees uh, and we are like two and a half years after that. And I'm like, 80% of my time on the credit side, actually, because we invested in a protocol called Maple Finance uh, when I was still an intern. Um, and we basically needed people to, to help with that because we wanted to take an active role and basically open up a pool there. So you know how they say that VCs only give checks. We wanted <laughs> to show, no, we are different and we are also providing real value real manpower and resources to um to make it happen so me and um, gabor one one other person that works for us uh, right now as an advisor and he has a huge credit experience from chat fight um we both of us like basically started the the first pool and we we got initial like 20 million um to, to to be issued to various market makers in the game like Wintermute, Falkwank, and so on. And the pool started scaling like crazy. So it it, it was a permissionless pool at, at that time. So basically anybody could participate in it. Um and there were pretty heavy liquidity mining rewards. So in USDC you would get around 10 to 15% APY, and then you would get like double uh in mpl tokens um so it was pretty generous offer i need to say and then the pool started scaling like the first 100 million we had in a month or two in in terms of tvl and then um then we opened up an, an if pool as well on top and for example nexus mutual deposit deposited like fifteen thousand if um to it so all in all like we they peaked at 450 million, I think, TVL uh, in April 2022 with more than 800 millions in, in loans issued. So from a from an intern that like, you know, just got some project assigned to to do, it was a it was a crazy ride. And obviously, like me and, and Ed Gabor, we couldn't really maintain it. So quickly after we started hiring more people. So right now it's like a very professional setup, on-chain monitoring, uh, everything is like top notch, like in a proper credit business. At the very beginning, it was just something new and <clears throat> we're doing, of course, our job diligently, but nobody expected that it's gonna blow up so quickly. So we needed to catch up with our resources and systems to really make sure that we are our, our job correctly. Obviously, like DeFi as a whole, and especially the lending space got hit very hard by all sorts of events, starting with uh, Celsius, FreeAC. Um, we are also lending to Alameda actually in the past. And uh, we're very happy that we stopped lending to them, I think in June. So we were like the first ones that like, you know, we, we, we saw the balance sheet and we saw what's, what's wrong with it, like much earlier than the article on CoinDesk uh, actually revealed it. So that's why we stopped our relationship with them. But then what we didn't foresee to some extent is like the contagion effect, because you can have healthy borrowers, right? That you still land and you believe in them. But like, we didn't expect that potential blow up of Alameda would completely exclude everybody from FTX and like the seismic waves killing everybody on their way uh, would also in, in affect us. Um, so we had two, uh, two, two problems in our pools with two borrowers. And um, yeah, one, it's almost fully resolved. Um, it, it's just a matter of a of couple of months when the full repayment will be done and just like some leftovers left. So let's say it's the, the first credit restructuring in crypto successful. So we made history here. The second part is uh, 
something that uh, couldn't be fixed because it was just well, maybe I shouldn't use this word, but to some extent financial fraud. Um, so um, so yeah, like that that that's something that is very hard to um, fight with if somebody is like you know not not giving you the the right information but but just something that he creates on his own of course we saw a lot of outflows and uh, now it's time to build to make the setting even more professional uh, to make sure that with the new way we are more than ready to get at least the same amount of capital and trust from people and uh, and deliver even even better value over over time so we are hiring more people investing a lot a lot into our own infrastructure for example of on-chain monitoring of, of borrowers as well as working with other parties um helping with that so we saw a lot ups and downs um mm -hmm. and we are now trying to use this knowledge as some sort of experts, I hope you can call it, um, in the in the crypto lending space to really make sure that the standards are somewhere higher. Of course, and you've obviously just got to learn from, you know. Also mistakes. Happened. Nobody nobody said that like yeah. we didn't make mistakes. We did, but you know we saw all players collapsing, like Genesis, BlockFi, etc. We also mm -hmm. see it as an opportunity that we are almost the last man standing. And um, it will be hard to rebuild the trust and um, and the whole setup and to enforce better rules. But that's our mission. And if we achieve that, then we are at the right place to basically be at the top of the lending game in crypto, which truly it's a, it's a huge market. Like, you know, when you look at other compound, what is that compared to uncollateralized lending? Like the the... The demand for uncollateralized lending, if you do it right, it's just like magnitudes higher than over collateralized. And let's see how fantastic things Ab and Compound already did. So that's why we bet on it. I know it's not sexy enough to, to use the term uncollateralized lending, <laughs> but it's inevitable if you want to scale crypto as a whole, you need proper credit. And without it, as we see right now, all of the maybe not all, but many market makers pulling out. Um, not 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 much demand for for capital in general. We see what's happening. Like the space is sort of dead. Um, I'm not saying it's dead that nobody built anything, but in terms of liquidity on the market, it mm -hmm. is dead. In fact, um, so we want to be a big supporter of that liquidity in the future and do our job in underwriting yeah awesome so you said you know under collateralized is the way to go now um what are the risks involved with that for you as a lender um yeah you basically like so it's a pretty it's a pretty broad question so like, I just want to make it clear that we are just not lending to anybody that comes to us. There's like a, a set of requirements that need to be achieved. And we solely focus on market neutral firms. So we are not at the moment or like in our history, we are not lending cash to people that I know just want to long Bitcoin, right? That, that That's definitely not the, not the right way to do it. And then collateralization is in fact needed. Uh, but when we lend to like the top market makers and, and they really do what they are supposed to do, then you are able to generate like steady returns, like nothing super crazy, but good returns over time. And the risk is in fact minimal. So the actual business model of market makers, it's ideal, at least in my view, to, to, to do uncollateralized lending. But the space needs to mature much more in terms of audits, um, security, that the things that happened in the last years, they just shouldn't happen this often, basically. Because everything is nice and funny. Everybody is making money when like the, the market is good. But the problem starts, like the true checks, whether, whether somebody is good or, not, good or not, happens in a bad market. Also with experience, we see 
um, who stayed with us, who who is still borrowing capital and um, who is making money at the moment because like in good times to make money like you know it's probably not that difficult and the pie was so big that everybody could take at least a little bit and still be happy but now the pie is so small that you need to be very sophisticated uh to beat i know 10 percent returns over a year because like if, if we land like our last loans were uh clearly above 10 percent um like to make significantly more than that, there is almost nobody at the at the moment that is able to generate those returns. So that's that's very telling. But like from you know, like we only deal also with potentially as for crypto, like large parties, like you need to have at least 30, 50 million at the very minimum equity and and track record 12, 18 months. Uh it it, it just like the selection is pretty pretty strict. Mm-hmm. or very strict I was actually okay. <laughs> yeah okay yeah so you were talking about you know sophistication <laughs> in trading yeah. and of course after all these years at Maven 11 you're you know you have more experience in trading now so could you tell us about your favorite trading strategies and how they've changed over the years yeah sure so I think like everybody sort of I don't know if everybody, at least that was the case for me. And also, I know, like when you read, for example, a book, Market Wizards or something, I see a lot of similarities. I'm not saying I'm like one of them and nobody wants to make a book about me, but it's more like with time, the things you want to keep very simple. Um, because at the start, you know, you watch all of those YouTube videos, courses, this, that, use this magic indicator, it will change the whole game. In fact, the less you use, the better. And the best indicator for me is actually the sentiment, like what's happening on the market. So when you see that the bad news are not affecting the price as much as they should, then it's, for example, maybe a hint that something is changing, that sellers are exhausted. We can see with FTX, right? The price should go to new lows afterward. It it would be pretty logical, right? It was like the worst event ever that happened and the price didn't do it. So it was actually hinting and it was actually a pretty good call that there is almost nobody <laughs> to sell their Bitcoin anymore. and these type of market readings are actually way better than creating just another line on your trading view chart, which I still use, but like the psychology and understanding the flows that, that happen and whether the liquidity is there or, 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 or if there is not, um, it's sometimes way more important than adding another, I don't know, RSI or, or whatever to, to your chart. However, like from, those things, simplicity, I think it's still the key. So support resistance, of course, the classic. Some people would say it's a bit boring, but it's, to be honest, like the most important thing that, that you should use. Um, I very like EBO levels. So like my strategy mainly evolves around that. Like I always look at those levels, and especially if we are in a in a good trend, I try to... I increase my positions at various extensions or reducing my positions this way. Basically, you know, it's not like it's a it's a magic number that will change your life, but just because a lot of people are using it, especially algos, these are good things to to follow as well. But it shouldn't be your number one thing that I only follow that and that's it. So that's part of it. So FIBO, support resistance. I keep keep my stuff like very simple. I actually don't use stop losses, which might sound ridiculous to some, but based on the market wizards, uh, I'm not the only one. Because I saw at the start, especially when I was trading like very, um, uh, very, very low frequencies, like I know five minute charts or something. Like, you know, the volatility, it's so big and it, it just like, you get wiped out with stop losses very quickly. At least that was always my experience. And I was always super pissed that 
you know, I, I, I had the direction right, but I was very last moment um, caught by, by, by my top loss. And then the price obviously exploded higher, for example, which was my direction. And I was like, dang, like, I cannot continue like that anymore. And when I also joined Maven 11, I saw that maybe drawing lines and, and, and everything at five minute charts, it's not the way to go, at least not for me. So I moved to, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour. Now I mainly look at four hour to one hour. And sometimes for entries, I look at 15 minute charts, but nothing like one minute, three minutes, five minutes. It's a... Uh, a bit ridiculous, especially if you use leverage. Um, so instead of stop losses, I just make sure I have my bankroll ready. So I basically use mainly FIBO and, and support resistance to determine where is the good probability of getting some bid. Um, I mainly you know, trade on the long side. Um, I find shorting like so counterintuitive. I know it's probably, you know, not the best to 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 be only long. Um, but also lack of position. It's also a position. Let's keep that in mind. So if I'm supposed to short, I just don't do anything because I just can't. You know, I was trying even with inverse charts and everything to 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 reduce my bias, but I just cannot do it. Um, so I look at all of those levels like FIBO and support, um, basically to determine that this is a high probability um, bounce moment. So in, in, in this level, there should be some reaction of price. So I put my limit orders on those levels that I think are significant and there should be some price reaction. And of course, the lower we go, the higher, the, the bigger my bet. So I start smaller and I start increasing the sizes. So this is how I build my position. And at one point there will be a bar. It's guaranteed. Like the price will not just like fall through and, and go to zero. There will be bounces. And on those bounces, if I feel that my position is too large and I cannot manage my bankroll properly, if we get another 20% uh, downward movement, I reduce it. So I'm basically dca all the way down with putting more and more weight on lower prices um, to finally get this bounce and reduce my position slightly. And if it's gonna go up, that's fine. I already have a decent position and actually, actually I can increase it after I know like my, my conditions are met again. Or if we're gonna go down, then I have enough cash in my hand to buy even more lower and this way i'm avoiding uh like the the timing of when it actually happens that position is going my way um and i my stop losses are never hunted because i don't have any and to be honest like with this method i was never liquidated since i trade so um i don't want to change something obviously in a in a bull market, it's I think it's the best strategy you can have because the trend is upwards, right? So we just need to have enough cash not to get liquidated and buy more and more on, on the dips because eventually the trend will be man maintained. Of course, the problem is when the trend, trend totally changes and you can keep on buying and keep on adding more. And if your cash management is not good, you're actually stuck in this huge position and you don't see any relief. I was in this in this moment one, once, but I was, I guess, lucky and, uh, and, and, and it reversed and I actually made a bit of money even with the trade. So it was fine, but it taught me that like, you need to really be conservative with your betting. So like, don't over bet. It's better to have too small of a position when you're right then super crazy big position that if something happens, like basically you have no more cash to like support it and maintain it. Also another downside of this trading strategy is that when funding rates are crazy, as we, <clears throat> as we saw during the last um, bull run, if the price is stagnant and you already have a pretty big position, uh, then you're paying for it every day, a lot of money. 
So it, you are actually losing every day and it's draining your wallet. Um, and if it's going to continue like that for a month or two, obviously you don't want to sell at the, at the loss because you still believe in your strategy and there is like no point of like on purpose losing money. Uh, but like the funding rate can also effectively kill you at one point. So that's something to consider that the sideways market is definitely a big enemy of the strategy as a whole. But again, it's it's very simple. I just DCA all the way down. Don't use stop losses um, because I was losing money because of them. And uh, just make sure that you always have this cash ready, that if something surprises you to the downside, you have even more cash to buy more there. Um, average down your price even lower. At one point, there will be the, this relief bounce. And that's why the FIBO levels and support in general wor works well, because there is always some sort of reaction or almost always. And then you just need to make sure that don't get too excited. It's going to go up only from now on, but really be committed to reduce your exposure if it's too big on this bounce. Um, because like, if you're not going to do it, this could be your only chance to reduce it and actually get more cash back. So you can buy lower if it's go lower. And if you're not going to do it, then like you can be liquidated eventually. So it's a, it's a big game, but I just want to mention that this is my own personal view on things. Uh, we no as, as a fan, advice. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's one. Um, and you really need to be comfortable with it. And also I'm not losing, using like crazy leverage, nothing, nothing like that on, on majors like Bitcoin and ETH one to 10, that's max on, uh, on smaller, uh, on altcoins in general, like one to six, that's it. Um, and I was also a lot of paper trading in the past, so I would. I recommend it to anybody actually. Uh, before, yeah, so I, I told you about that. I was very pissed that like I blew away all almost all of these profits that I made in 2017. And um, for two years, I was mainly paper trading actually, not touching any money, just like trying to understand maybe I should have started playing with smaller money a bit earlier because it's completely different you know if you put your money at stake so i would say start with paper trading and then go to small amounts relatively quickly and then stay committed to to learning um but i also wanted to add that just for clarification like maven 11 like as i said we are mainly a venture fund um, and we are not using this type of strategies for for our uh, trading we are mainly looking at narratives, um, what's going to be hot next, where the money will move. And I also using that with my picks, right? Like I prefer to trade something that is trending at the moment. I don't know if somebody uh, was following XRP, which I no longer really support, but uh, XRP was outperforming the market for a while already, actually. And you want to be at this hot places basically because then your strategy actually can be executed better and you don't have a sideways market but you can actually see some action so xrp was performing pretty well uh um, not anymore actually at the moment but uh, that's something that you also should consider like scanning what is outperforming the general market um, or if you are a short trader, like if you like to shorten what's going down more than the rest. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a good thing for selection. For example, me at the moment for the many months, I don't trade with leverage any altcoins. I solely focus on Ethereum, actually. It's something that if you also follow a price action of a particular coin, like 24 seven, you also feel it way more. So. In a bear market, low liquidity environment where altcoins, you know, like completely zero liquidity there, like complete desert Sahara, you can have these flash crashes and of course also to the, to the upside, but like the risk there, it's exponentially higher than something so much more liquid like Ethereum. You just develop the, the feeling towards this 
particular things. I would also suggest <clears throat> if somebody's starting, focus on, on, on one coin and start to feel it, play a bit uh, with small amount of money, try to develop your strategies, start, start to uh, like be committed to it and see see what happens because then you can really realize if this is something for you or not. I remember the hot moments in a bull market when I had like four or five coins at the same time. You know, like the bankroll, the cash management, like to maintain all of those positions. If something goes wrong, especially in my strategy, uh, it's increasing the risks of getting liquidated exponentially. So in a bull run, if, if you do it, okay, that's digestible. But in the current environment, it's it just like, a recipe for catastrophe. So I would really focus on one position, make sure that uh, you know what's happening, you understand the risk, you understand your liquidation level, you understand how much money you need to have on the side in order to protect it if you're planning to use something like I do. If not, use stop losses, but don't be too tight with them because it's actually very obvious that where people put stop losses. So where you think it's the right spot, it's usually the worst spot because everybody knows about it. So that's that's also something to consider that uh, I think you're smart. Yeah, below this line, I'm going to put my stop loss. Yeah, there is 99% of people think the same thing. And then one guy just going to dump on you and and, and buy, buy it back lower and you will be crying that... Uh, you were right about the direction, but in fact, you, you lost like a couple percent on it because you were wiped out. So yeah, many things to consider. Uh, my strategy, it's not for everybody. Uh, I just feel comfortable with it because I'm using it for the last two years or so. Uh, never got liquidated, which is also pretty good uh, track <laughs> record. Um so I'm going to continue doing it, but I just adjusted that for the last months, I'm not touching anything besides Ethereum. And uh, unless the good times will come back, I'm not planning to touch anything else. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So good times. When do you think they'll return? <laughs> Golden question here. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, like I actually thought um, before like all of the attack from SSC on Coinbase, Binance and, and everybody basically, I actually thought that we're gonna um, get people by surprise that we're gonna have a massive rally still this year because everybody was super bearish, nobody was believing in it and you, that's also another thing, you always should look at the most uncomfortable direction of the market or the like I thought that everybody that wanted to sell already sold, right? Like after FTX and all of this, like who was left to, to, to leave? Mm -hmm. There was almost nobody, but many people were side sidelined as well that still wanted to participate in the space. And the good old FOMO, it's what creates another little bubble. I didn't say that like, we're going to get another all-time high or whatever, but a good rally of Bitcoin to like 45, 50K. Why not? Think how many people would be like, damn, Bitcoin's already at 35 and I sold at 20. I need to come back. And more and more people would be joining. This would push the price even higher and the people even more conservative. Oh, Bitcoin's at 40K. I'm not going to miss another all-time high. I need to come back. No, and this is generating this bubble, which of course at one point would stop because if you go from 16K to 45 or to 50, there are also new sellers joining. While at the start, there's almost no sellers because everybody's told. Then with every you know magnitude higher, 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 higher you create potential new sellers that already make, made a good buck. So I didn't expect that like in this also macroeconomic situation, are we just going to continue to rip higher and, and have all-time high 2023? No, but I thought also with TradFi performing well, it was the right ground to actually do something unexpected because who would be calling for Bitcoin at 50K? Almost nobody. And usually that would be the point where, you know, like people would jump back in and it all aligned in my head. So I was hoping for a huge relief rally that would melt faces and people 
wouldn't believe and, and a new small a small or medium bubble would be created. But like the action by the regulatory body, so the SEC, kill the momentum, kill the liquidity. And right, right now we are in this environment where platform is ripping higher and higher. And the correlation with crypto, it's actually very, uh, very low. It's actually negative. I think I was checking, I actually wrote it down somewhere here. Yeah. So with NASDAQ, Bitcoin at the moment, it's minus 0 0.54 and ETH, it's minus 0 0.6. So, you know, like that, that's usually quite the opposite. It should be positively correlated and, and highly correlated. So the problem is that when Stratify will nuke lower, then guess what will happen with crypto? I very much doubt crypto gonna start. You know, it's it's rally. It's it's what it actually would become more correlated by going lower again. So mm -hmm. we are in this very uncomfortable situation when we are missing out on the positive stuff that it's happening in US with inflation going lower and everybody becoming a bit more happy, maybe soft landing, maybe no recession and so on and so on and so on. And we are missing out as a crypto because of the uncertainty and uh, people that are afraid to do business within it. So that's affecting the prices, I think, mostly. However, this Bitcoin spot ET ETF um, request, if you can call it this way, by, by BlackRock is very telling. And actually the fact that they announced it right now with all of this drama, it's even more telling. Um, so I think like this could be a catalyst for some positive news going forward. Also, you hear some rumors about Fidelity also being interested in their own uh, ETF. So I checked yesterday night, like the weekly closing of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and especially Bitcoin, it looks great. Uptrend is there. We have a nice hammer, or how you call the this candlestick pattern. I'm not, not gonna embarrass myself, but basically at peak bearishness, when everybody thought, yeah, we are dumping lower. We're gonna see maybe not new lows, but we're gonna go much lower. It was all bought up, and we ended up the week with very very nice candle. If we are able to continue the uptrend from now on, then maybe my envisioned uh, rally still can happen. And everybody is so bearish that actually it would be a perfect ground to show them that, no, you're wrong. And then they will need to jump back at one point and fuel the price further. So that's my idea for it. I hope it, it will materialize, but of course I'm biased and it could be just wishful thinking. Although I really don't foresee new laws because again, who would be the seller to push it to new laws? Like something dramatic would need to happen. Uh, I don't want to, you know, jinx it, but like yeah. something like Binance <laughs> completely blowing up or something, then we, we can pack our bags for a couple of years and really maybe change the, change the industry. Nah, I'm, I'm joking to some extent, but like that would be really a killer. Um, but the signals are, I think, rather positive on that front. And also the court ruling that they that they made a pretty good deal with SEC right now. It's also telling that SEC couldn't even prove that any of their allegations are, are true. So that brought back some comfort to me and I guess to many people in the space as well, that maybe it's not that bad as they portray it. And it's like with the tether fad, right? You hear about tether being uh, scammy, uh, of course, it, it's not my opinion or, or the firms, but uh, it, it just like you hear about it for years and then who the pack, the USDC the pack. So it's always the opposite of like people are pointing fingers at this one thing and usually something else is blowing up and you don't see it because you treat it as something normal that it's actually perfect and it's usually the, this thing that that has problems so you were talking about your kind of well your outlook is quite positive and you know let's hope it does go to that but what are you doing now to prepare for your vision yeah so um in general like i was a pretty big buyer of eve and a couple altcoins that 
after FTEX, I, I really felt it was a very painful moment because you thought, yeah, maybe it's over for real. But these are usually the best moments to buy. So that was when I was starting to build my position. My entries are way lower than we are at the moment. If we're going to get another dips, I will be maybe not super happy, but I will just buy a bit more. And uh, I'm researching, I'm looking for promising projects that maybe not necessarily I want to invest right now because again, like the altcoins are probably not the best pick in the very short term, but some prices are start to look very attractive. So DCAing in, buying a little bit here, a little bit there of quality projects that you believe the narrative will be there in a couple of months because there is some big upgrade, for example. You should look for these type of things that are non-existent now, but could happen in the future. And for example, align with some big upgrade. Um, you should also check how can unlocks, whether you know the team will not dump on you in the next couple of months and so on and so on. So to answer your question, I am uh, accumulating some positions, especially in EVE as my number one choice and researching more projects, listening what's out there, where the true, true innovation is brewing at the moment and starting to slowly get into the altcoins, even though it's not the right pick probably for the next month or two. I believe we are so close to a total capitulation on, on, on altcoins, like in terms of price relative to Bitcoin, Ethereum, US dollar, it all looks horribly. So it's usually probably a good sign to start slowly building a position there. And, uh, and when the time comes, uh, I will be allocated to it. Um, yeah. So basically I, I believe in, in trusting your gut, maybe not necessarily at the very beginning when you're just starting trading but really the patterns are repeating that maybe the news is always a bit different but like the psychological reaction of the crowds it's usually the same we saw COVID-19 um, big flash crash we saw like any other crashes it's, it's always the same psychology you always feel your stomach that oh maybe this time it's really over so you really need to fight with it then and click this buy button but to be in this position you need to have some cash always uh, lined up on the side for those type of events so um i never go all in that's another thing that i do i never go all in at once because as i said i'm buying more and more scaling scaling lower um but i also never go out at once because like i don't know if tomorrow the price will go another 20 percent up not just nobody knows so i prefer to not do things all at once both buying and selling because just nobody knows and then you're averaging your exit and and and, and entry price and i think for majority of the people um this is a good rule to follow for example, you could buy your Ethereum every week or every two weeks. If you want to make it a bit more sophisticated, maybe buy whenever Ethereum is more than 5% down on a day. And over a couple of years, this should be a pretty successful strategy, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if you, if, you want to, if you want to become some sort of a trader, then you just need to watch the charts 24 seven, really, uh, like remember the, the price. That's why it's good to focus on one coin because like, if I look at the Ethereum price action every single day, then you also develop this gut feeling like what will happen next to some extent. And you're probably not going to be right every time or maybe not even 50% of times, but when you are right, you just gonna know like how to execute it properly because you just saw it so many times and you're used to it. So that would be my advice to really focus on something and stay committed and don't change your strategy because uh, you're making more money at the moment. And it's, it feels convenient not to, for example, reduce the position as in my case, like on this bounce, like if you deviate from that, then, okay, one time it's going to work out. You're going to make a bit more. But the other time you will be fully liquidated and it will be for nothing. So 
stay committed to the rules that you prescribed before. And that's why algorithmic trading theory is superior because you always follow the, the your algo always follow the rules and there is no emotional side added to it. The, stay stick with simple rules, stay committed to it, and it should be fine. Amazing. That's, Thank uh, you. <laughs> That's the takeaway, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you for your, well, experienced tips. Well, thank you so much for watching this episode. And thank you, Wojtek, for your time. And I'll see you next time. Bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>